Hello everybody and welcome to another PMP end of month review. What is this? Well, this is when we go through all the end of month sub submissions in the Painters Motivating Painters Facebook group. Uh, the link for this group is down below. If you're a hobbyist of any skill level from just starting out to master, we'd love to have you along in our positive uh, constructive, hobby-focused community that's all about helping you take your next step on your hobby journey. Uh, this in particular, we host an event every month. That event has a theme. Uh, this month's theme was armor or vehicles, and uh, we invite members of our community to post there, uh, to share their work, and get some critique. Uh, so I'm going to spend uh, the next however long it takes, uh, going through everybody's submissions. Uh, as always, you can't post more than one thing for submission uh, and review, and I ask that you do include something you would specifically like feedback on. The more specific you can be, the better. Uh, also, don't write me a novel. <laughs> Just a little thing. All right, so uh, without any other advice, let's get into it. We're getting into... Uh, armor, so we're going to be talking a lot about weathering, about panels, and uh, and how to sell the overall effects of these inorganic machines. Um, so this is Ian Stanley, who's bringing us a uh, Sisters of Battle, uh, a Sisters of Battle uh, Knight. So let's take a look. Uh, Sisters of Battle Knights are something I certainly know uh, a great deal about. I've, I've done many of these. Uh, and it's my favorite, uh, one of my favorite things to do with, with Imperial Knights is, uh, make them into Sisters of Battle Knights. Uh, and you did a nice job connecting that giant piece of pewter. I know you mentioned that, um, the purity seals, the roses, the eagles, things like this are nice touches. Um, I, you know, I like all the conversions. Um, things that work for me, uh, are, I think the, um, the heat effect on the gun is is nice it's a little too much blue you really want to minimize the blue um because it would be that that staining wouldn't go back very far it should become purple fairly quick but it, it it's not bad overall um i like the marble effect um the big like brass printouts and the various things you did are nice um the metals themselves are really flat and this is actually going to be sort of my main piece of advice for you um when we look here at a picture like this this is going to where we really see it the the metals especially the gold because it's really the dominant metal here is quite flat it doesn't really have enough contrast and and even though this is a very big machine that is to say this figure is seven eight inches tall nine inches probably ten and maybe with the little pipes on the back um it's it's still a very small scale like you know in effect this thing should be huge right it's it's a very very big thing and so it should have the same level as contra of contrast we would expect from, you know, any 28 millimeter miniature, right? So uh, we definitely want to, to make sure that we're adding tonal variation, that is to say, uh, contrast of value into those golds. I've got lots of videos on that. The other thing I would say is with something like this, you want to make sure you vary the metals, but also it's a great chance if you're going to do things like the, 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 heat metal on the on the weapons you also want to have some battle damage here and there big robots like all inorganic things don't heal and so you know any amount of combat or fighting or even just normal use is going to cause wear and tear even if that's just little scratches scratches and basic grime it's a good part of any vehicle so those would be my main that, that would be kind of my main feedback for you there but i hope that helps all right next up uh all right william thompson uh says he focused on contrast and weathering using the weathering for contrast in some areas adding variety to some of the metals like your thoughts on the pose and composition uh and then so let's take a look so he he has reposed it to be in this very like down and sort of forward kind of position um i think that's fine it's still readable uh you didn't like move it out of there to the point where i can't tell what's going on anymore um, so I think the pose is overall fine. The green parts of the armor as well as the black looks really nice. 
I actually quite like the way you've integrated the weathering. I do think that sells for me. Um, you've added brown in some really nice places here to create sort of uh, interesting, really, really interesting variation. So I actually quite like that, especially you're, you're focusing both on interest to in the shadows, which is a place you can hide weathering to make it more visually interesting other than just being black. But in addition, you've also put it in where I would expect natural weathering and wear and tear to occur. So around things like rivets and stuff like that, panel lines where I would expect water to gather. So yeah, now there's a couple odd angles here because of how far you've leaned him forward. And it, you know, it might be that in effect, he's a little too far forward, like he would be slightly off balance. He might, his, like his front leg might need to be a little more out. He's, he's in, like he's, his center of gravity is pretty, pretty out here, you know, kind of over his legs. So it's hard to believe he's not falling over, but it's, you know, it's a minor thing. It's not the end of the world. Um, I like the, the, uh, images here on the, uh, arm plates. I think those really sell. I like that you put some weathering over the top of them. That's good. Um, opportunities for improvement. Uh, I think we could go a little, be careful with your metal scratching. I think we could go a little farther with the steel. Some of the steel is still a little flat. So some of that could have a little bit heavier shading. Um, when we're going to do little scratches and scratches like this on the steel, we, we want them to be um, really, really super thin. So you need to get a very, very, very sharp brush, uh, very, very, very wet paint. And you need to be, you know, like really uh, getting those lines to be ultra sharp and thin. Uh, but overall, it's a great looking piece. It, it sells for me. I like it, William. Okay, next up, Joseph, Imperial Guard armor ready to flatten the battlefield. Uh, does the camo work well on the models? What can I do to increase the weathering and where does the OSL work? Okay, camel, care, sorry, camo, camel, for goodness sakes, camo, weathering, OSL as our main pieces. Okay, so um, let's take this individually. Does the camo work? Sure, it's fine. Um, you know, camo is just an unusual pattern that's on a vehicle. There's nothing that you can kind of do anything your heart can imagine. Um, it's good that you weathered over top of it, especially on this one. That looks really nice. Uh, so that, you know, that sells for me. The pattern is strange and unusual, but camo patterns are meant to match to whatever environment they're in. So if that's what the natural environment is, sure, it works for me. Um, the weathering and wear on the models... You need to think more about not just like you use a lot of sponge weathering clearly or something akin to that. You need to think more about scritches and scratches. Like your bullet holes don't totally sell here. They're not dark enough. They're not deep enough because of that shadow. And they don't have enough. And, and the light line is too big on the underside of it. But they, their vehicles would also get scratched. You know, vehicles that drive mainly forward, so tracked and wheeled vehicles, right? are going to get scratches going like this, like backwards along the side. There's going to be scratches going directionally, right? Because they will be driving and kicking things up and stuff will be hitting them. There will be bullets that, zoom, you know, ricochet off the side and put a scrape line down there. There will be things that grab the side of the vehicle and claw at it or, you know, whatever. You can, you can pick your thing. But stuff like that's what's going to happen. It's going to create those directional weathering points. The other thing that I don't see a lot of here is streaking and that's really i think where we had a lot of opportunity um especially on vehicles like this that have these really strong angles right where you could be and, and rivets the combination of, of angular surfaces like this and rivets means that water is going to collect dirt builds up and then the drops down and it drips down and it drips down and you get streaks that build up over time so something like oil streaking uh, or something like that would have been pretty great um does the OSL work? No, it does not. Um, because it's just too bright yellow and there's no darkness around it. Um, for lights to work like this, like they need to be weaker. Um, the light would not light up this whole thing right here. Like why is the light shining on this thing that is not where the light would hit? Like your headlight, go outside and turn on your headlights. Does it make the top of the car right above it brightly lit? No. And as a point of fact, it doesn't actually do much of anything. Like, turn on your headlights in the middle of the day, which is how you've painted the rest of this thing to be lit, and it's not going to do much at all. Um, so if you were going to go for selling this lighting, um, you need, like, all OSL is a combination of a few factors. You need a very bright spot that is the light, 
it needs to fade slightly around it. There needs to be a dark ring where the light isn't, and then there needs to be a very soft glaze that trails off into the color of the of the the main color that it is. So it's almost like white, bright, intense color, dark ring, soft color, right? And this is just way too intense, like way too yellow. This just looks like it's painted yellow. It does. It's not glowing like it's something that's glowing. Um, so you got to pull that way back, especially since these guys are painted basically like they're in a daylight scheme. Like there's nothing that would tell me this is nighttime or make me believe that this is the only light around. Um, so because there's no shadows, this light is way too bright and that's our general problem. Um, yeah, so that's probably the area where I would focus on. So there you go. Hope that helps Joseph. All right, next up, uh, Benedict. Uh, hey, Vince, uh, two years on my desk prime as part of the first 40K box I bought. I'm open to any suggestions. Paint it, uh, paint on it as high high tabletop standard or above. Okay. And yes, and I know you know the barrels. Uh, <laughs> I want to reread this. And I know, I know the barrels are not drilled out. There you go. Yes, I will always watch to see if barrels aren't drilled out. Drill your barrels, people. Come on, it's not that hard. Just do it. Get the pin vise and do it. Um, so once again here, the same thing with the lights. I mean, everything I just said is true again. These little bars aren't light, so they should be dark. Like, they should be creating shadow in the center point of the line um, because they would be blocking light. Um, we need more of a, a circle around this of not light, and then this needs to be way weaker, and these areas up here would be extremely soft if they had any light on them at all. They're like, if they're out in front of the box, it's like they're barely out in front of the box. Like, they're like this. And that's, this is not going to cast a huge amount of light up on, on this area right here. Okay. Um, now, on the rest of the panel modulation, I don't have much of a problem with it. You've generally caught the light in an interesting way. So as to your general tonal variation on the panels, it's consistent. I can see the lighting scheme that's going on. So I have no problem with any of that. Um, your sponge weathering, you went for the metallic undercoat. I generally am opposed to that because I, you know, like I don't know that these things would scrape away and show a lot of metal, like especially gray metal. You didn't, doesn't seem like you made it super shiny, so I'm okay. If you're going to do sponge weathering and show scraped away metal, um, then it should be dark. Uh, you want it to be like a dark steel or something like that because it wouldn't have been polished to shine. It's enameled over. That's the whole point of it. It's sort of very industrial, right? You're not going to polish something to chrome and then paint over it. So, um, assuming that what chipped it away didn't also polish it, that is to say something scrapes away the paint, it's going to create a sharp silver line where it puts its claws through or whatever, you know. Um, I think the real, you've got a lot of that going on, um, but most of it seems like it's in a pretty logical place. Like, that is to say, I'm seeing a lot more up front and in areas that are kind of, you know, facing the front of the tank. So, that's pretty logical to me. It looks like as we get toward the back, I'm seeing less of it. So, I appreciate the 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 attention paid there. Um, I like the, the symbols and everything you scattered around here. Those all look nice. The, the deco work is good. Um, the, uh, the, the metals and steels and stuff do look pretty flat. A problem that I often see on vehicles, you know, if you're going to have your airbrush and you paint those metals on, if you're, cause you clearly did some of this with an airbrush, um, you know, take that airbrush, put in some, uh, like a Payne's gray or some dark black ink or something like that, thin it way down and just shoot your metals from beneath, right? Like get on the airbrush and just get underneath the thing and shoot the metals up from the underside. It's fast and easy and it'll give you a, a sort of matter or shadowed finish. That would be kind of my main advice. Um, the other thing that catches me is these are a little too dark and it doesn't look like it's from soot. So whatever the, I don't, I don't know what these things are on the side of rhinos. I don't know if they're meant to be smokestacks or something. I'm not sure what they're meant to be. But uh, either way, like, they should have some kind of light on them. And then, assumingly, if they, if they are belching smoke, if that's what's happening, then there would be soot. But it wouldn't be this all-encompassing, and it would be more of, like, a stippled effect. Like, because where, like, how soot would gather around the top of a chimney or something like that. Um, it's, it's dust that settles, right? So it's going to be a very sort of speckly type of thing. So you almost want to use stippling to get that on there. Um... Yeah, those are my main thoughts. Uh, overall, it's a very cool tank. I mean, it, it, if your goal, by the by, was high tabletop, you certainly achieved that. No, no issues there. Um, you, you, you're very much in that place. 
All right, next up, Miguel, uh, Invictor, Tactical Warsuit, aiming for a decent tabletop quality, but would like to up my game to get to display. Advice on volumetric highlights, edge highlights, quality of the metal parts, and weathering. Okay. So, the metals, let's start at the beginning. Metals need a lot, lot, lot more attention. They are flat, they are boring, they are just silver. We need to go way, way, way farther. So, it, like, again, I'm going to give you the, the, how do I go from tabletop to display? So the metals need to go a million miles farther. Integration of contrast of both value and hue. Um, there's not enough browns in here. There's not enough other colors. There's not enough shadow. Uh, there's also not enough shine. All of these feel pretty flat. So we've got to t just knock that contrast way, way, way up. Um, same with the blue, for that matter. Um, all of the blue is really lacking any depth. Like the weathering is over top, but I'm not seeing way enough shadow especially on the hidden parts of the blue things that would be dark and in shadow the tops of these panels where, where less light would be gathered but really especially here on the front under these things um the edges aren't quite uh clear enough on some of the pieces though what you do have like i can see here and here and these that looks really nice you've clearly got a very fine touch for edge highlighting which is fantastic where here is where we're going to talk about a lesson Okay, when we're doing these kinds of scratches, painted on scratches, I teach these a lot in, in a weathering class that I teach. I hope to get back to those next year. The very first thing I say is we're going to do these scratches, and I don't want, and, and the, the thing that will make it look fake immediately is if you make them all the same size. So don't make them the same size under all circumstances. Don't make them the same size. Vary the size. I tell everybody that 10 times, and then I tell them to go ahead and do the exercise, and I walk around. And I would say 9 out of 10 students make them all the same size. Because human brains like to make things symmetrical. Uh, so, this is the same size as this, and this, and this, and this, and this, right? And this. All of these scratches are the same size. And there's no real logic to what's causing them. None of them have any variation. They're not torn. It's just as though, like, it's as though the same person went around and keyed this vehicle in a very symmetrical way. If you're going to do these types of scratches, they have to vary in size, and I mean really vary. Like, some have to be like this, and some have to be like this. And they have to go at different angles, and some have to crisscross, and some have to be jagged, and some have to be ultra, ultra thin. So they have to vary on width, on length, on type, on placement, on angle. If they're anything else but that, they will feel inorganic and fake. Okay, so you have to turn your brain's desire for symmetry off and really like scatter them in a random but logical way. So that is to say there was no order, no planning, no person ever sat down and said, let's put some scratches here, or here, or here in the universe of the model. But they happened where these things would naturally happen. So around places where it would fight more, where scratches would occur more, right? Like what's grabbing the sky here? What's causing these, right? Scratches should be, you know, located up. The, the same thing but with the contrast on the driver, by the way. He's too flat. Um, the same things for the blue there. Like, this area would be highly damaged. It's the front center of the thing, right? Or this area of his arm, which admittedly you do have it there. But, like, some of these other pieces are... are, are there's no logic sort of to how you've damaged it. Um... So watch when you have those scratches. Don't just make them lines. They can't all be the same size. And the, the white line needs to be a lot thinner, by the way, when you're going underneath. And you want to tint it a little bit into the blue spectrum, like those look a little too white. You can start with white. That's fine. But then you've got to glaze color over it to the color that's underneath it. Because it's meant to be a light line where it's capturing the tiny amount of light that's caught on the edge of the tear. All right. So there you go, Miguel. Hope that helps. Uh, this is an amazing piece. Okay, so I'm not sure I'm going to... Alexander, I'm not, I am not. I looked over this, and I'm not sure I'm going to have you much to tell you. So this is a 1 2700th scale Imperial II class Star Destroyer. It is 60 centimeters long. Uh, <laughs> like, these. this is a very impressive project. Like, I... Go check this out, this post out. It's... Incredible, because it has LED lighting and all this stuff. He said it took him about half a year to finish. And, um, you know, so this is like, I mean, we can take a look here. And and he's absolutely right. The Like, keep in mind, this is all LED lighting and stuff like that. It's just incredible. Like, we'll flip around and we'll see all the different things he's done. You know, it's really challenging to add value to this stuff when it's this uh, scale. Because... 
you have this problem that any amount of placed contrast will feel way too big on something of this size. So the thing that occurs to me about this, and what I'll say is it does still feel a little flat. Like weathering is hard to do in this scale because you can't paint things small enough and that kind of stuff. And what would they weather anyways there in space? You know, I think this looks really great. And I think it's really impressive. I have to wonder if what we could have done to spice this up a little was to increase some of the aztec -ing some. Um, because I feel like almost what's missing, like when you look at... Let's see if we can find something. Let's do this. Uh, Star Wars movie prop uh, Star Destroyer. Let's just do that. There we go. Cool. Uh, I'm trying to find one that was actually... There we go. This one in the original movie. Yeah, like, when we look at these models in the Star Wars exhibition, you're honestly pretty close to where they were. Um, like, it feels pretty dead on to, to the original things. If you look at, like some of the shots of some of the ships it feels like they've they've got here we go this will be a nice one right like you can see how they're using the extreme light in the studio to cause to create visual interest which i saw you did in your, your picture as well um and you know i think that there's a little bit more aztec you can see here where it's just like those little variations of light and shadow like of just changing the value a tiny bit through the aztec -ing, I think could be what helps. Um, because these are also really big models. And, I mean, if you look, there's not, like, this is one of the original, or, um, you know, like, this, it's not a huge amount of variation here, right, as far as, like, what we would think of as traditional tonal variation. So I think you're pretty, I think you're pretty dead on. Um, you know, you could always do a little bit of very slight coloration on some areas, like just the lightest, lightest, lightest touch under some things that are really, really hidden in shadow. But I, but I'm not sure I would. I, I think this is a freaking masterpiece, man. It's incredible. Like this could be a Star Wars movie prop. I, I think you nailed it. It's, it's a very impressive piece of work for scale modeling. So I'm not sure I have any real critical feedback for you other than to say, well done, sir. Well done. Time well spent. You made yourself a truly amazing model. Okay, Nick Curtin. Uh, hey there, Vince. Made this walking steam tank out of the parts from a guitar toy that I stole from my son and some beads. Would love to hear your thoughts on the weathering and how I could push the paint job further overall, going for a whimsical, grim, dark look. Sure, so fun little piece. Um... Yeah, so, I mean, it's definitely very weathered and rusted. Um, I do appreciate your rusting technique. It's really nice. You've got a great uh, separation there between, like, the paint and the rust. Good colors of yellow and orange rust and stuff like that. So I think that looks uh, really nice. Um, now, as to the, the paint, um, you know, I think some of the things you could use a little bit of what I would what I would think of is just like clean edges, uh, stuff like that. So like everything is old and weathered and that's cool, but we should see like some scrapes or scratches of cleaner metal here and there around the edges of things or on guns or on just, you know, pieces where the metal has been scraped shiny almost. Like I was talking about earlier, if something with force hits the thing and it's scraped shiny, I think that can be a good way to add something that's got a little bit of brightness to it. Um, I mean, that is heck of a crazy thing to turn this into this uh, well done my friend that is a that is a uh for and those pe and people say wargaming is too expensive just is that true or you're just not creative enough uh no it's i mean this is a really really cool project um the only other thing that jumps out at me is stuff like this this extra little thing here with like this little cloth piece hanging off like that doesn't feel naturally weathered um like that's not how dirt would gather on a piece of cloth um, so that part jumps out to me as a little problematic. Um, but as far as the all the rest of these inorganic parts go, I, I like it. I like the dirt collecting between the little rubber walkery legs. Um, yeah, that's all fun. So very cool piece, man. 
All right, this bad boy, Emil, uh, constructive criticism on this guy, largest project to date with over 300 hours of work put into it. Uh, sure. Uh, okay, so a lot of stuff. I, I read through all this earlier. It's it's pretty incredible. All right, so I'll, I'll give you some feedback on some pieces. Um, the freehand of the emperor up here on the banner, I'm not sure what's going on there. I don't. The yellow doesn't sell for me. I like the base image, but I'm not sure what's going on with the, the yellow aura. It's hard for me to tell. I love the, the Emperor image down here. That looks great, as does this piece and this piece. Like, the, these are... You've got some really solid freehand components on here, man. Um, the... Oh, that was my only picture. Okay. Uh, the... Uh, so I, I like all of those. I think those all sell. It's really only the banner that gets me. The, by the way, I know you said you made the banner and the smoke out of... I don't love the smoke being a big T-shape. I'm not sure what's happening there. That's a little weird to me. Like, I understand maybe you're trying to represent it like kind of being at the edge of the frame. But I would have rather, like, if you if those little wings weren't on it and it was just a little puffball coming up, I would honestly like it a lot better. Um, the... The when you banners, I wouldn't make them out of green stuff. They always end up looking too thick and not sort of like cloth. It's just it's very hard to make, to get cloth thin and and shaped right out of green stuff. Um, if you need to make a banner like that, I would highly recommend you take a thin piece of plastic card and you get yourself a heat gun and you just you cut it to a rough banner shape and then you just apply a heat gun and let gravity kind of do its work and you have it create natural bends. It's a really easy way to make fast really good looking banners um now as to the heat effect itself it mostly sells i could use a little bit of hot hotter parts on some of the bigger areas so like the chainsaw and stuff like that you got a lot of area where we just kind of go into yellow orange here and nothing gets hyper hyper hot it'd be neat if in some of the deepest areas here we had some hot 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 like we do down here i really like it around the feet and in the, the base of it so it'd be cool if some of a few of those elements were really super heated as well um, the blue gun is very eye-catching, but, and, and normally I would bust people's chops for, for having a, a, such a super bright, intense color just in one place, but in this case, I understand why. Um, and also, I don't think it actually distracts that much, because so much of the rest of the piece is, like, bright orange. Um, it would be cool if you could get a second blue, even if it was small, like, it'd be neat if this gun was glowing the same blue, you know, that would have been a cool way to balance it out, which is another minor thing to keep us moving across this direction. But there's a lot of visual interest going on on here. So, uh, I, you know, it's not the, not the end of the world at all. Um, overall, this thing is rad as, man. Uh, incredible piece of work. Something you should be very, very proud of from the base to the, the pilot to the all the green stuff work to everything. This is a uh, an absolute masterpiece. I really love how this came out, and uh, I think you should be very, very, very proud. Uh, well, well done. This, this is what I'm here for. This kind of stuff. If you know me, you know I love Imperial Knights. I love it when they get crazy. They are just a big, giant palette you can do whatever you want with. And here we see an artist doing something awesome. So, well done. All right, next up, uh, Thomas uh, started this as a quick project or this much entry, but had more fun with this than I've had on any other model, so I just kept pushing it farther. Do you have any suggestions for me on the treatment of shadows? I found it hard to differentiate a warm shadow from a brown-black grime, especially on the back left quarter in Photo 4. Um, okay, sure. So this guy's real nice. Uh, I like this a lot. I mean, these Nurgle vehicles are really fun to paint because you get to go wild with texture and weathering and stuff like that like nurgle vehicles are vehicles are admittedly a special kind of, of fun um now uh, just you know swapping around this guy let's start here um all this looks good this all sells to me the eye needs more variation in it so an eyeball an iris is not a uniform color all the way around it has shadow at the top light at the bottom because it's effectively like a gem in how it gathers light together so you need to you need to vary that. Um, look at Richard Gray's eyeballs and his freehand. That's the best thing I can tell you. Like just go look at the master and and really really see what he has done. Um, now on to your question. Here we go. Picture four. Um, so the the talking about the difference between you know sort of shadows and grime. And the answer is, who cares what the difference is? 
Like, that is to say, grime placed in areas where it is lighter will be grime. Grime placed in areas of shadow will be shadows and grime, and that's fine. You can kind of, as I mentioned earlier, you know, it can be a little two birds, one stone situation. I quite like the flesh here. I think this thing is good. It's hard for me to get a read on Nurgle and competitions. It's going to sort of be highly based on you know, your area and the competition in general and kind of what they value in that sort of uh, uh, thing. Like if they, if there are some competitions don't love really like love super rusty, crusty type of models. Um, some competitions absolutely do. So it's, you know, that's, it's tough to predict with stuff like that. All competitions have bias. Um, just a couple things that stand out to me on the weathering is we're missing some orange in this and it'd be a great compliment to add some more real color in here. There's a little bit up on these spikes that I see but then, like, I see these heavily pitted and rusted areas here on these kinds of metals, and I don't really get the yellow, orange, maroon rust that I would expect to find in there. So a little more variation. Maybe it's pigments. Maybe it's a dry uh, application. Maybe it's a, a bit of stippling. Whatever. Just to pushing that a little bit more is going to add more pop and visual interest to the piece. But overall, very cool thing, my man. All right, next up. Uh... Looking for feedback on the Gladiator. I put a lot of time into the customization. Would like to hear your thoughts. Also curious any thoughts. The paint job. First time doing a heavy, heavily weathered vehicle. Um, sure. Uh, so here's the basic vehicle. We'll just take a look here. Nice, nice little additions. Good, good. This is a great reference for people who want to look at stuff like how do I add traps and things like that. It's, you know, a lot of things are, are not actually super hard to to add on. It's just cutting little little uh, thin bands and smoothing them out, and then applying them. And now let's take a look at the uh, the final. So, yeah, man, um, this looks good. I like the sort of, I don't know, Talaran desert scheme or whatever it's meant to be. But, you know, this sort of uh, uh, color pattern I like. Um, I think the it is extremely heavily weathered. But I think that the weathering feels apropos. That is to say you have focused it in the right areas. I do like the OSL glow here. This is what I'm talking about. See how there's almost no green up here. It's mostly down here. It's very soft, right? And so, yes, this this is good OSL. I like this. It's just a nice, gentle light. It's not, you know, pow. This is brighter than this. Brighter, softer. Yeah? And there's a nice dark ring around the thing where it's not casting light. Um, the regular metals here feel pretty boring, pretty flat, not a lot going on with them. That's probably the biggest thing I see as uh, as an opportunity. I feel like some of those should have been brought up, even if it was through maybe more stippling and rough application and hatchy scratchy lines um, because of the nature of the weathering. And then, you know, have some application of, um, you know, browns and blacks and inks and stuff like that to bring it back down and add in more weathering there. The metals all feel suspiciously clean and flat compared to the vehicle, which is heavily weathered and dusted and visually compelling. So that's my major challenge with the model. But overall, uh, very cool work, Rich. I really like the conversions. I like how it came out. You, you did a great job. All right, next up, JD. Recently discovered hobby cheating and quickly became a fan. Uh, red, green, colorblind. I chose a red army because I like frustration. Okay, volume shading highlights in the hull and turret. Uh, the idea was a light was coming from the front at an angle, uh, weathering and battle damage, and of course general feedback. Sure. So our lighting is not far enough. Uh, we'll start there. Um, we, I have a video on panel modulation, on the different types of panel modulation, and what it means to you know how the lighting can can function on vehicles. But we need to go farther here. We're not respecting enough of sort of the shapes and the angles and catching light along them. Like I'm, you can't. This is off camera, but actually, you know, let's do this. See this, my wall right over my, this is a wall right behind me. Everybody can see this in the camera, okay? See this wall right here, there? Notice how the lights are up here on the ceiling, right? But see this area of shadow up top here, and as it gets toward the corner, it goes down, right? By the staff. There's a shadow coming up here, right? That's a, those are just flat surfaces with flat panes of light hitting them, right? And you can see how the walls themselves are reacting to it. So the, in the same way, you're going to have the panels modulate, okay? So that would be my number one thing. Go watch the panel modulation. Check that out. Now, 
As to the weathering, um, it feels like we could use a little more like sponge type weathering, something like that, smaller chips and dots. We have some good, decent sized holes and scratches and scratches, but we need to bring in that small size damage. It would all, I would also expect things like pigment, dust, stuff like that, um, just to add weather, texture, dirt, grit, grime. Uh, final thing, when you're applying decals, I would go watch my decal video. I talk about how you blend them in because the challenge here is I can still clearly see the decal outline. Um, you, there is a series of steps you need to take with those to fully integrate those into the piece. So, uh, yeah, go check out those videos. Overall, it's a good start. Uh, keep pushing, my man. All right, next up, Philip. Uh, first of all, Philip knows I love Battletech and knows I love full-size Battletech. I despise teeny tiny mechs. The reason I don't play Battletech is because is because I don't want to paint a mech that's this big. That's boring and awful, and they all look dumb. But this, this, this is how Battletech should be. They should be the size of Imperial Knights. This I'm into. I am deeply into this. Deeply. Okay. Uh, at any rate, this is amazing. Um, so, love this dude. Uh, the He looks nice. Uh, I like the color scheme. Um, yeah, I, li I like him with his little friend, by the way, in front of him. That's fun. Um, the, the weathering here looks good. I like the different, you know, we're going to flip through the different sort of you know, armaments and things like that. Um, I think the weathering looks good. It might be need to be a little more directionally focused. Again, same thing. There's probably not enough brown and black type of scratching. We've probably jumped too far to too much orange rust. So here we've got almost the opposite problem as the last time. Like we don't have enough brown, like the Nurgle model. We had too much brown, not enough orange. You have too much orange, not enough brown, right? So we need more of the generic sort of brown rust weathering grime stuff like that that's that's going to be here i know he's on kind of a deserty planet um but then if that's true if he's on a deserty planet i would also expect the blue side to be showing me a lot more yellow sand in between his feet and uh joints and stuff like that uh so um those are kind of my main things we also need a little bit more panel modulation so that you know, the panels themselves are a little flat more value more more panel modulation more variation of value so those are the areas that jump out. Beautiful looking base, by the way. I really like that. That looks super natural. It's great. The tuft needs some paint, needs some uh, some wash and some paint, but that little green tuft is the only thing breaking me out of it. The desert rocks and desert sand, I think, look really nice. Um, so yeah, super cool. Uh, I dream of the day when someone makes a full-size or a print in general of the mechs that I want to print um, and paint because I am a fan of a very select set of mechs mostly the 2750 and 3025 variants uh you know the atlas the banshee the black knight and these do not exist in prints that i can find um for the right for the right variants and i'm particular i'm very i'm a man who has a very particular set of tastes uh so anyways uh super cool i love this more of this please throw battle tag at me all day with giant size full size battle tag and i'm i'm there all right jacob uh, so dreadnought and first time having to pose a model this big, uh, when putting the kit together, I struggled with the right pose at one joint and how it would look, it would impact the next joint and the overall look. Uh, so advice on that painting, tried to make the armor true metallic green, blue, but I lose a lot of the shine when applying the color on top of Leho metal color chrome. I use as a base. Um, sure. How can I bump the shine and still control the shade and highlights? Yeah. Okay. So let's talk this through. Um, it's tough to tint metals and effectively what you have to do if you're so the, the way you need to do it is you need to tint the metal when it's steel so what i mean by that is if you watch my video on like speed painting with true metallic metals right and zenithal you'll see i talk about creating a, a black to bright silver zenithal sort of from the rip in just silvers that's where you start okay then over that you take one to two extremely thin glazes like through your airbrush or whatever of the color so that you're really just filtering the color and you're going to rely on the fact that you've already created on the silver level shine and shadow to do the work for you 
when you have to do that work as part of your additional layers, you've got to put on too many layers, you're going to kill the shine. Okay. So that's my advice there. Now, as to the posing, I mean, sometimes it can be tough. My best advice is, you know, you kind of learn as you go along with when you do more of these. I mean, I, I people screw up poses the first time on big monsters. I don't know that there is a great way to do it. Um, you can try like blue tacking things together and then just see how you kind of build out the pieces or dry fit them and stuff like that. But there, I'll, I'll be honest, there is no great way. And so those would be my pieces of advice for you. Also, with this type of metal, you can also sell it by then going in and re-scratching it and revealing metal underneath, non-tinted metal underneath. So scratches and scratches here is where you can reveal like a steel color or something or having a claw mark in that's like steel, but then there's a bright silver line on the bottom. Something like that is where you can sell that and that will rip, that will put the metal idea back in everyone's mind in a big way. So uh, there you go. Hope that helps. Uh, what do we have? Oh, geez, I don't know what I have there. Okay. All right. So two more left. Here we go. Probably something a little different to me, a T3485 and 148th scale. Um, so the modulated paint style is a divisive topic in the traditional armor modeling community, but as someone who entered scale modeling from painting wargaming miniatures has always been something that I've enjoyed. Yeah, I mean, yes, it is. So I believe in panel modulation. There are many different types of panel modulation of uh, that. That is to say, you can have it be more traditional zenithal. You can have it be panel to panel. You can have it be um, up lights, down lights. There's there's a hundred ways to do it. And and scale modelers are a stodgy bunch of people who believe that realism means making things um, in one particular way. And that's not an insult to their community. The scale model community has been doing it longer than us and better than us. Um, but they have a very, as a sort of collective group, you know, an idea of, of what is traditional scale modeling. And my answer is there's nothing wrong with that, but it's not the only world. I love highly over accentuated contrasts and panels and uh, or zenithal schemes, or, or whatever. Like I said, there's lots of different lighting schemes you can do. And their art, like this is an artistic pursuit. None of this is realistic. Um, none of it. Uh, because realism is a nonsense concept. Um, we're, we're like, if we were really concerned with realism, we would ask all sorts of important questions like, is it cloudy? Is it sunny? What's the lighting condition like? Because this tank would look vastly different and have vastly different lighting if it was noon on a sunny day versus 7 p.m. on a cloudy day. Okay? Versus uh, the golden hour when the bright sun's in the sky and it's kind of, and there's it's a bit red, right? Um, versus moonlight uh, would make the tank look very different. What's realism? Realism is capturing the light in an interesting way because there is no platonic form of light, of a, of a model. It doesn't exist absent its surroundings in a void like we take pictures of them. They exist in a world that is occupied by light and color, right? So the, I say that to say whatever you find compelling is correct, okay? And don't let anybody ever tell you otherwise. As long as it's a coherent artistic expression, then it's fine. Now, um, as to this guy, I think this is super cool. Uh, I like it. I, I think you've modulated the panels in a pretty minor way, honestly. Um, like you didn't go huge in on it, so that works for me. Um, nice, very nice collection of weathering here. I love, love where you have collected the weathering and rust patterning. That looks extremely natural to me right along the panel lines in these depressions at joint at metal joins. Yes. Molto bene on that around rivets and things like that. It's fantastic The the, um, handles and stuff like that, that people would be regularly grabbing, uh, feel more, more weathered because they've had, you know, human hands scraping them constantly. So that's a great touch. Um, just a lot of little elements to this. I quite like, um, I think this is a fantastic tank. I think your your weathering is really what stands out to me. The numbers look a little too clean. They feel like they don't have enough of the streaking or dots or they're not broken up quite enough. That's like the 341 in the circle here. It didn't feel like it. It feels like it was put over the weathering when it should be the other way around. Like the weathering and scratching should be happening on top of it. That's the only thing that really jumped out at me from this. But yeah, so there you go. Overall, very cool. And finally, Tiny Tank, uh, Resin and Metal Panzer IV from Flames of War. Um, 
yeah, I mean, this is a very tiny little tank. Um, when it's this small and, you know, you said your hand brushed, it's tough. I would maybe think about some more weathering. I've got a couple different vehicles on weathering um, uh, vehicles. I would check those out because I feel like in this kind of scale, it can be cool a cool way to break it up. And, you know, when you're hand painting a vehicle like this, it's tough to modulate and, and, and panel modulate shadows. You could always try a little bit more. It, it needs more contrast um, of value. But I think you could also achieve a lot of that through... Um, through contrast by of, of hue through the weathering and stuff like that. So some chips, some scratches, some rust, some streaks, things like that is what I would look to. So hope that helps, Belint. All right, so there we go. That brings us to the end of this month's review. Uh, thank you all to everybody who submitted. Uh, as always, if you'd like to join us, check out the link below. Uh, and you can uh, you just have to click that. You must answer all three questions. If you don't answer all three questions, you will not get in the group. But as always, I very much appreciate everybody who submitted. Thank you to everyone. If you're out there uh, watching this and you're part of the PMP, please keep it positive. Help people out. If you see something you love in the PMP, stop, hit that like for that, or jump in, leave a comment that says, I think this is awesome. A simple comment, a few likes, you can change somebody's whole day. It is an amazing power we hold with social media to use it for good or evil. And I want to see us use it only for good because we can, I want to revel in the power that we have to radically improve people's lives by taking two seconds out of our day to help to answer a question or to give a positive comment that reinforces someone. You can change the trajectory of someone's day, someone's week, someone's life with a few simple seconds of your day. That's the promise of this community. And I, and I, I hope what we all want to live up to. So keep being positive and helping everybody out like that. And uh, as always, we'll see you next time.